Tonight's event is not the traditional debates we have been used to. For this quarter of the CRI debate, it is a special event, a town hall with His Excellency Julius Marabio, marking the third anniversary of his ascension to the presidency of Sierra Leone. On the 4th April 2018, the retired brigadier became the first elected president of our country to have been born after independence in 1961. Coincidentally, it is 60 years this month since Britain handed over control of our nation to us. The president came with his vision to address some of the perennial problems that had beset our nation before the Union Jack was lowered in Sierra Leone. They include the setbacks in ensuring law and order, governance deficits, increased poverty occasioned by a sliding economy and official theft, the steady erosion of the country's human development capital, protecting the homogeneity within the diversity of our cohesiveness as a nation, and accountability, especially in the fight against corruption. But how much has President Bill done in the last 36 months? to mitigate these harsh realities. For the purpose of this town hall, we shall limit our conversation with the president to those key areas, which, by the way, are cross-cutting. The town hall will last for 90 minutes, including a 10-minute break. And the president will have a 30-minute cocktail with us at the end of it all. Now, we have a very simple and straightforward set of rules here tonight. Please turn your mobile phones on what I call double silence mode. And we should desist from making any sounds of approval or disapproval at what will be said. We will only clap to welcome the president during the interval and at the end of the debate. I understand what is called spontaneity, but I also am familiar with what is called discipline. On that note, I wish to welcome the president, Julius Marabio, to this, the first ever presidential town hall in Sierra Leone. <laughs> welcome, Mr. President. Have things panned out the way you had expected them to? Of course, not exactly. Um, it has been a very difficult period, as you can all imagine, because of the enormity of the task at hand. But with the leadership I'm providing, I'm confident that we can lay the foundation to move forward. I'm going to ask you a very interesting question. I think it is interesting because um, even if for a few weeks only you had been a head of state before you were elected uh, three years ago, how do you compare the two amidst the accountability frameworks that exist under your current mandate and when you are military head of state? What's the difference? where I had the freedom to choose what I wanted to do for my country without much ado. Today, I have to take it to cabinet. I have to take it to parliament. I listen to civil society, if they are here. <laughs> I have to listen to everybody. Um, it's, it's totally different. You can do uh, quite a lot. Uh, with the military government, but I'm not uh, suggesting that we go military anymore. That's why I took off my uniform. So I'm very happy to be a civilian leader. Interesting. I, I'm sure somebody might be interested in knowing a bit more about that. But let's get down to brass tacks, Mr. President. We're going to start off with the economy. We've got a few blocks that we've established which we duly informed you about. We're going to begin with the economy, which obviously is very key, because whatever you want to do, you definitely do need to have a strong economy for the finances to be able to do so. Now, as a candidate, you and the man who would later become your vice, your vice finance minister, Jacob Safa, decried the state of the economy, promising to fix it if you got elected. Would you say you and your finance team have done a good job of fixing the economy of Sierra Leone? We have not fixed the economy to the extent that we would want to. But we've started the process. And I'm very satisfied with the state of where we are today. We, as you rightly stated, you cannot run any country or even an organization with a battered economy. So we knew we were going to meet with a very difficult situation. And we were equally prepared. We had planned for 
victory. And so when we got the victory, I selected um, JJ Safa, whom you just mentioned, to lead my team of economists for economic recovery. Have they done a commendable job? Yes, I would say. And that is why they are still there. If not, they will not be there. <laughs> what did we do? Um, we don't have the rest of um, the activities we are engaged in. We needed to win the confidence of those allies. So what did we do? Well, we made a commitment to them. But I must say first that um, they had left this country already. Why? Because we, as a country, the former leadership was never listening to them, and there was poor economic management, high inflation, huge debts. to take over a country like this. So with all of that in mind, we decided we were going to do what was necessary for economic recovery. And one of the things we did was to, one, gain the respect and confidence of our partners. And uh, we engaged them, made a commitment to them with certain reforms, and we engaged we, with those reforms, and they later realized that we meant business and we were committed. So the IMF came on board. And uh, in, the, uh, in the review by the board, they accepted the, a three year economic reform for Sierra Leone, uh, econo economic program for Sierra Leone by the um, economic recovery, uh, they would help us. But what is important about the IMF is the fact that when you have a program with the IMF to come back, especially uh, donor countries that had abandoned Australia because of poor economic management, the World Bank and other institutions noticed that we were serious and committed. So that was how they came back, and uh, the rest is history. You can see their participation, you can see uh, even in the middle of COVID, we are able to get uh, And it's interesting you spoke about the IMF. Giving you a clean bill of health. To the ordinary Sierra Leonean, their basic understanding is the brass task. I mean, the issue of commodity prices, the issue of the value of the Leon. And let me just quote you this um, How do you plan to stop the apparent free fall of the Leon? I wouldn't call it a free fall. Definitely, we've had challenges. Even when we are making every effort, we are putting our heads to the problem. But they are actually, and we are not getting anything from outside in terms of uh, uh, um, 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 to, to, to boost up our economy. 
So we had uh, inherited an extremely difficult challenge. And to take on these challenges, we've had to generate executive order. We were able to get enough, accumulate enough, to even start a national program just rolling out the free quality education, which, by the way, is one of the most ambitious and audacious uh, programs we've had in, Af in Sierra Leone after independence. So we have been making effort, and we will continue. Our heads, uh, we, we have our heads around it, but we, we have to have the right climate of course as we we are making yes subscribe the you always the watch me program them, it, but you not uh, subscribe it to the channel uh, always you get to reactivate press this red the subscribe economy, button then we have the and then you come over here and press, press this bell uh, so the bell option be press this one with all a London, a nugget for cost of anything. When you do this, we now sign for Chaussee, you the support we, we are make we do more. Thank you. So, so we do um, um, and you do not share this program. Overnight. Yeah! You God bless you. Have the um, and you do not start to export overnight. You have to have the infrastructure. I will say that um, this is a job uh, uh, in progress started. And uh, we are going to continue to uh, uh, recover the economy. Now, you spoke about mining companies. We'll come to that shortly. But let's take revenue. Uh, in your manifesto, it was clearly stated that your government would ensure that revenue G 80% by 2021. Now, in normal terms, domestic revenue has increased. However, going by that measurement used in your party manifesto, this is hardly the case. Let me give you some figures as well. In 2018, 0.3%. In 2019, it was 15.5% of GDP. Now, in 2020, it fell right down to 13% of GDP. Surely, this is nowhere near the 20% mark you had earmarked for this year. Sure. I think uh, COVID has speared no country, and we cannot expect to be an exception. The economy contracted, and therefore, uh, our target, and, and that is one of the... When you asked me, has it been... No, because we did not factor COVID in our equation at all. But it came in, and it, had, it has impacted the world, and Sierra Leone is no exception. So we should be surging forward, and what we do is resilient recovery, and we have a plan for that. Uh, once we get COVID behind us, we are going to surge forward again. Hopefully, COVID will go away very shortly. That's our wish. But let me talk to you about the issue of revenue GDP ratio in the area of expenditure. Because if you can't get more, you cannot certainly expend more. But the figures here do not seem to add up. Now, the public expenditure tracking survey was conducted by your administration, but the results have not been made public. Now, there is this perception that the results would have shown your government in a bad light. Hence, it wasn't released to the public. I'll give you some more example. Wages and salaries, page 95 of your party manifesto. When in opposition, your party manifesto was clear about what you termed the uncontrolled wages and salaries of the previous government. Mm -hmm. Again, in terms of numbers, in 2016, wages and salaries amounted to 1.8 trillion leons. In 2017, they went up to 1.9 trillion leons. In 2018, when you came to power, let's say halfway, wages and salaries increased to 2.1 trillion leons. In 2019, your first full year, they went up to 2.5 million, and in 2020, 3.3 million, uh, sorry, trillion. There is clearly a pattern that your government is adding to the wage expenditure, especially between 2019 and 2020. What would you say accounts for that bloated public expenditure? The wage bill. If we are not doing exactly what we are supposed to do as a nation, we will never move forward. Development will never realize in this country. Before today, 
you will realize that everybody was talking about, especially the nurses, the teachers, pin code, pin code, pin code. We trained a lot of people and we just abandoned them. And But we need them. And in fact, as I speak to you, we still need more nurses, we still need more teachers. We have taken in about five uh, 5,000 teachers and 4,000 nurses and that is still woefully inadequate. How do you want to be taken care of if you went to the hospital, to the hospital today? Effective, efficient nurses. They are not there. The, a lot of them have been trained and they were not on the payroll. They were uh, for the most part. And when you do that, you don't expect a lot from them. We are talking about education. How can we embark on education without the quality aspect, which is provided for the most part by the teachers? Thousands of teachers are still languishing after having, ha having been trained. So, uh, but, but let me come back to this. The opposition or those who talk about that we are not able to pay those that small number but we have been pay, able to pay ours consistently since we came we are dealing with a nation so it is not the numbers are we taking teachers for the sake of taking teachers no are we taking in nurses for the sake of taking in nurses no Human capital development is our flagship program, remember? And for us to deliver on that, the, especially the education aspect, we need teachers. Good teachers, well motivated. So we've had to increase their allowances by 10%. We've had to increase their salaries by another 30%. Same for the nurses. This is not money wasted. So you can understand why the, the continuous uh, increase uh, in our expenditures. Could another reason be the issue of extra budgetary expenditure as well? Because uh, that remains one area which uh, challenges our administration very persistently. And I tell you what, I have read some documents which suggest that Parliament approves budgets, but some ministers, departments and agencies get more than double their allocation, while others end up getting less than half of theirs. Is this a case of poor planning on the part of your administration, or, or, or why is it happening? Well, um, the I want to do today is to explain in general terms the, strateg the strategic vision which I have and the leadership I have provided at the highest level. When it comes to details of that nature, I will make my Minister of Finance available one day to make clear on those, on the, on the, because I will be speaking completely out of um, uh, 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 my, my, my range if I, if I attempted to answer that. And, and I don't want to lie. I understand, Mr. President, but the point is if it keeps happening repeatedly in various ministries and MDAs, clearly if there had been a proper due diligence to have studied what would be needed, you wouldn't have the idea of some having their allocations doubled while others would get half. As I've stated, my minister will competently answer that. Today, I cannot, and I don't want to lie before this nation. I take that. Jobs. Um, jobs have been few and far between. Fewer and farther between because they've always been, been scarce. But one reason why these jobs have been lost, and there's hardly any family today that doesn't have somebody who's had to lose a job for one reason or the other, which is biting deep into the pockets and even the survival of, of many, many people. The mining companies, uh, at least one of them, have their, their license terminated, SL Mining. And uh, Shandong, the issue of Shandong was more, like, more or less like killing a dead man. They were more or less on their way out. And then that's ended. Would you say that uh, you were ill-advised by um, your legal people and those in the mining sector in, in, in killing the horse that was laying the golden egg? Well, I don't know how golden that egg was. <laughs> but if we are to check their contribution to national revenue, it wasn't much at all. 
provided jobs, quite a lot of jobs, Mr. President. Yes, we are going to provide more jobs, but we need to correct the mistakes that, are, that was involved in the mining lease agreement that they had. And what are those mistakes? Quite a lot. Quite a lot. And that's why I don't want, like, you, I think uh, you started the, the conversation by saying certain specifics. I will be able to give you specifics, but what I don't want to do is to gloss over those in a way that we not uh, 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 give justice to the issue that I want to. SL Mining decided to go out to the court. I ordered them to negotiate. So I, since the matter is in the courts, I don't want us to talk a lot about that. But I want to give you the assurance that whatever we are doing, whatever we are doing to cure that situation is for the best interest of this country. We want to be able to, to get more from our resources and we are not getting much. I don't want to delve into the details as far as SL mining is concerned, but the only assurance which I will give to you is that at the end of the day, we will get a better deal and Sierra Leone will benefit more from the mining, the, the, the natural resources that are there. It's not going anywhere. It's there for us. Let's exercise what I will call strategic patience. Because we have not been patient in giving the, these resources out, we have lost quite a lot in the past nearly 100 years. And that is the, because we did not plan we did not seek the interest of this country, and that is what I'm seeking. So there is haste to bring the little they can bring, but you only have to deep dive a little, and you know that uh, it's all not it, it, it's not all glossy, as a lot of people think. We can get more from those resources, and I will ask for strategic patience so that we will um, put together agreements that are in favour of this country. Talking about mistakes of the past and uh, things that are in favor of the country, I just want you to confirm this. I understand that one of the vexed issues when the Africa Minerals um, Company Limited had their licenses approved was that the rail and port was handed over to them for 99 years instead of the state running the rail and port and renting it out to mining companies that would want to use it. I understand that the same mistake is being made, if not has been made, in terms of giving the rail and port to a single company. Is that true or not? That understanding is completely wrong. <laughs> the asset there now belongs to the state and we, we make more money. I'm saying again, Paupa <laughs> Salongo better. But we have to. Why? We, let's not rush into this. If we say it has been a messy field, we cannot just jump into it and let things continue as usual. That is why I need money. I need to make everybody uh, give them jobs. But I'm deliberately holding on to this so that we can have better arrangements. So the, 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 the rail belongs to the state. And we can now lease that out to any entity at our own pleasure. So mining companies will be using it as and when they pay for it or will one single mining company be be in charge of it, which clearly if that happens, they will see other companies as rivals and they will charge them an arm and a leg. And that's why we've been smart. <laughs> it belongs to us. We know Kumbra. That Kumbra will get two pick in them. Two in them. If they know how they they don't. <laughs> the arrangement is such that it is available to all, uh, any mining company that can have access to it, you know, if you can create your, your infrastructure. So that is why we have taken ownership of it. It doesn't belong to one company. As I speak today, if another company comes in that area, general uh, uh, geographical area, they will have access to the rail. Okay. Now, what must Sierra Leonean businesses hope for in terms of economic conditions? Tax incentives, less bureaucracy in awarding of contracts and access to policy stakeholders? In other words, how do you improve on the doing business atmosphere in Sierra Leone, which some people say is cumbersome? Yes, um, 
not as cumbersome as it, it, it was. How has it improved? Not as cumbersome as it was. We know that we need to improve on the uh, um, business climate. And one of the ways you can do that is to clamp down on corruption. We now have a board that examines every proposal that comes here that is of significance so that we can look into that before they are given the okay to go ahead. And once the board decides on that, you can basically accept that your business is going to go ahead. And that is manned by me and my vice president. Because we notice that a lot of companies that come here and they will stay in the hotels and leave because they are being harassed by different people who try to uh, mediate between them and the, and, the, uh, and the offices. So we have we, to reduce that and to reduce the, 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 the bureaucracy, we, we, uh, we have decided to create this board and that is taking care of that. And it, it's a one-stop shop uh, uh, facility wherein we will look at the strategic goal of any particular enterprise and see if it aligns with national development and what you want to do. And if it sits well with it, our business is to facilitate. We will give you a stamp of approval. And once that stamp of approval is given to you, you can actually get things done. But when I spoke about corruption earlier, it is because if and when we as a nation, I am leading the fight on corruption, but I need everybody in this hall and in this country to support and embrace the fight against corruption. We, if we can reduce that, it, it becomes easier. There is this thing of 419, uh, four, uh, four, four, where we have Sierra Leoneans who specialize in that, and they, they drive out genuine investors. That is corruption. You are depriving the people of Sierra Leone of very good investors. Not all investors are, are, are patient and are good investors. We want to be able to screen them and be able to make sure that, that they will not encounter all of those challenges. Again, we are giving uh, uh, tax incentives. Um, I will cite two um, companies, the ones producing Paddy and uh, Kisi uh, Industries producing the oil. We want to help those. Those using local content in terms of their uh, raw, raw material and they are moving, even started exporting, they deserve to be supported by us. So depending on the nature of what you want to do and um, um, we try to provide support for them in terms of tax incentives and any other thing that you think we support get established, which is the most difficult. Which means also that we have to be serious about infrastructure, electricity, water, and communication, because you don't want to come and set up your own plant to support your factory. You don't want to uh, look for water if you want to set up a factory. So, but um, cash intensive infrastructure programs, but we are working very hard to make sure that we have them at hand for those who need them most. Any idea when that one-stop shop will be established? It's on already. Uh, we obviously just have to um, 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 launch it actually. To your flagship project, the issue of human capital <laughs> development. With the benefits of hindsight, would you say that um, the proclamation was a bit rushed? Four months into office, you pronounced it. Would you say you should have probably given yourself one more year to have put things in place? Classrooms are overcrowded. Teacher-student ratio is discouraging. You know, and uh, structures do not seem to be really functioning as they should because of the sheer scale of the project. Do you think you should have waited a little bit? Once the Athens of West Africa now are the, if you want to 
cover up. You don't start crawling. <coughs> you get up and start running. You will fix all the others along the road. But you must crawl before you walk. You must walk before you run. That is the mistake. There are times you get up and start to run because you have been there before and you know the benefit of quality education. We were ahead in this sub region, if not, and because of our carelessness as a country, we are now at the back. You are not going to start to crawl. Get up and run. We, 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 we fit in. We are successful right across a lot of indicators. If you want to fix all the classrooms before you, you, you declare quality education, uh, it won't be in this time. If you want to have all the money, uh, train all the teachers, you, it will not be in this time. Take the bull by the horn. The whole bull will come. <laughs> and do you... The issue of scrapping the senior secondary school year four, um, I know that when you were with the NPRC, that was one of the pet projects then. Is it a matter of going back to what you believed was right at the time? I'm asking this because actually what the kids now have is only two academic years in senior secondary school. Because they go to SS1 in second term and they write their worst exams in the second term of SS3. It's only two full academic years. Do you think that is what has led to the mass failure in, in the worst exam? No. Uh, you seem to like NPRC quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings very interesting memories to me and a lot of people here. I'm fixing a system that is fit for purpose in this century. We've had a lot of challenges even with the school calendar and we are working the what has been happening in the past as you know like examinations the, the kids who are no longer studying anymore and we the parents we are supporting them and giving them money to buy papers the teachers and the principals, we are helping them to have access to this. We are killing the soul of our own children. And this on channel 31 the authentic voice of sierra leone watch we program them but you not subscribe yet to the channel all wait till you get for do press this red subscribe button and then you come over here to and press this bell to the bell option press this one with all and don't don't and not get for cost you anything when you do this now sign for show say you the support we for make we do more thank you for all your help we for share this program yeah god bless you
the, the, the students in that uh, Lincoln wing. COVID, as you know, we started paying for them. Two million was paid. But then we realized that it is unfair to pay 30 million for one student in Lincoln Week, which government has to pay by the nature of the agreement. Whereas even our kids, our students in commerce don't pay that amount. And to make it even worse, this whole arrangement has never gone to cabinet. Even worse, they, it, they have never got, taken it to parliament. And it was an arrangement between an individual and a private institution. So we inherited the, 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 the nature of the challenges we inherited are not easy to navigate. We have these students. It's our obligation. We preach human uh, capital development. We want to see them go through this. But imagine again, to even compound the problem, most of those who went to that university did not have the normal requirement to attend other universities. So how are we going to take them there? So we have, this is a compounded problem. It's a dilemma. We have to get the kids. But the interesting bit that you would maybe, and all the, key, the, 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 the students that are there is that we have made an arrangement. And the, the new minister is going to take that as a challenge, one of the first uh, chores he has to be able to, to, to get over, including the students from Lincoln Wing and other stakeholders we want to sit down in dialogue and find an amicable solution so that our students that we care for will be able to go to other institutions, but we cannot continue to pay $3,000 for one kid, in, uh, uh, for one student in uh, Lincoln Wing when uh, government scholarship is maybe $500 per student or $700 at most in other universities. Uh, that is not fair. And that is not going to and we don't even know where that is going because it's a private arrangement. I understand that, Mr. President. I think I'm, I'm a big fan of the Catholic University in McKinney, probably in part because my wife is Catholic, but also because that place has done a lot of good things for that I, part I'm of the I'm a country. Catholic. Maybe you should like that more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but maybe somebody could say Unimax should have also benefited from that. So we can argue about whether or not the state should pay for students. Benefited from? From the pay you're talking about to a private university. But the point remains that your administration continued paying for them for one year. Had you not thought about all of that before you raised their expectations and paid for them for a year and discontinued? We had just been approached. We had campaigned on human capital development. Poor students, and we are faced with this, we decided that was an entry measure, and then we wanted to find a, a permanent solution. And this has been difficult to find, and that is why I have attacked the new minister to really delve into this matter, deep dive with all stakeholders, including the students, so that we find a solution to this. We'll quickly talk about the health sector under human capital development before we go in for a break. Are you satisfied with the state of the nation's health? No. It's a work in progress. It's been a very long time working in progress. Three years. Three years. What has changed? One of which sector? has been taken by COVID. We try to make an unfair comparison. We cannot change the health system without the necessary resources. Do you think anything has we changed? We cannot change the health system without the human aspect of it. Left with me, I want the health system to be like the NHS. National Health Service in the UK. Correct. Tonight. But can I do it? I do you. I have the human beings capable to do it? Do I have the money? What we have been able to do is to take, especially primary uh, uh, health care, that is almost everywhere in the country. We are taking care of that so that we can prevent the occurrence of a lot of diseases. When we came in, an anecdotal 
evidence that suggested that. Our intervention through the, the, the National Ambulance, Emergency Ambulance System, has reduced mortality and infant, infant mortality rate. That is because we were able to deploy all of the, uh, all the ambulances. We had to fix them. Remember, they had already started looting parts of it. Some of them had their engines ripped off. We had to repair everything, and we have deployed them around the country. And that is, I was pleasantly happy when I went to Kamakue and uh, 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 Fintonier, and they were telling me, these ambulances are saving our lives. We cannot change overnight. And maybe with that question, I want to appeal to Syrian Unions that Rome was not built overnight. America has been building, and they are still building, three, four hundred years later. The great United, uh, uh, I mean, United Kingdom. We have to understand this. Even if I had all the money, I cannot institute the, the sort of changes that we expect. Development is a painstakingly slow process. It may be so and development things. needs all of us to support it. It does, but the reality is some of the most basic things are a luxury in Sierra Leone. It took only a single Sierra Leonean nurse in the United States to establish um, a center here to provide dialysis for her father, and that has become the only dialysis in the country. The state does not have one. A mammogram to detect breast cancer early enough virtually does not exist in the country. Surely these are not luxuries. These are the most fundamental things which we lack in the health sector. You are not accurate in the facts <coughs> there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Correct me, sir. Um, we have dialysis now, the, uh, machines for dialysis. And that we only brought in when we came in. We have also supported a private um, dialysis center, uh, encouraged one of, not, she, she, it's, it's a medical doctor, I think uh, they have four stations there. And we are encouraging others, not just in Freetown, to go to the regions, because it is not only in Freetown that we have needs for that. So, as slow as it might be, because we can, we can have the funds to buy the machines, but we will need the people to operate them and to fix them when they break down. This takes time. Are they working now, sir? The sure. machines. Sure. We, we, listen, the, um, uh, the technical people who can man these machines are being trained. You cannot, it's not a car that you just turn and it works. You have to know how to man them. The private one, another private one, in addition to the one you've mentioned, which I don't know about, is functioning as I speak to you. And we are training people to man those effectively. And we are talking about cancer. The new um, health uh, village that we are creating in, in Kerry Town is going to be revolutionary and, tra and transformative because we have realized exactly what you are saying. We don't have to fly out. We have very good heads. We have very good medical doctors. What have we done? As I speak to you, through the Mac Foundation and through Madame's effort, I think about 12 medical doctors and nurses are being trained in oncology. It will be useless to have a mammogram or any of these things here if you don't have those who can competently man them. So we have been intentional in how we approach these issues. When I spoke about Keratin, is that, is that reference to the, the, the cancer center which you have spoken so much about? Say again? Or is that different? You spoke about the cancer center which you said you wanted to establish. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the Keratin project or is it different? Keratin is a health village. We are going to have several uh, medical facilities, uh, cardiology and all of these centers. One is a private one which is also located in the same vicinity that we provide a range of services, medical services. We are also going to put, using the funds, by the way, people have been asking, where are the funds? Those funds from, um, 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 uh, from uh, anti-corruption are ring-fenced. 
when will that ring be taken off for the diagnostic center to be set up? Uh, when you have two million, you cannot set up a diagnostic center. So that's why we have ring fenced it. Not even the Minister of Finance can touch it. <laughs> so when, what we are doing is uh, um, we, have, we, we have gotten support and we want to increase the quantum so that we can set up a full-fledged I did say that will be seed money. It's not enough to be a full-fledged center. But we are a compassionate government. We care truly for the people of this country. So we don't only want to educate our kids, which is our responsibility, by the way, which we have taken as a, as, 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 as a government that it should no longer be your responsibility, except you want to send them to private school. We will pay for every kid. And if we want to take care of the kids, or every human being, we also have to do so uh, in terms of, uh, um, uh, pro by providing um, health security. And that is why we have increased the budget from 7% to 11%. But an idea when this, I'm keen on this diagnosis center because I've read some very grim um, literatures of late about the number of people dying of cancer in Sierra Leone. It's a silent killer. My friend, my very close friend is suffering right now with cancer. And I, I thought that we might have a clearer idea as to when this diagnosis center will be set up, which will, I would imagine, have a, a cancer treatment center. Do we have any idea when it will? My mother died of cancer. We care truly for every Sierra Leonean. These things do not happen overnight. It is good that you have a president who keeps his words. And we are intentional. We, want to, we don't want to be flying to the other countries of the world to seek services that we have the heads to provide in this country. The facility will be there. I, what I hate to do is, um, in as much as I know about a range of activities happening right across the government, until I have a very definitive answer to issues, I don't want to make speculate on, national, uh, uh, on a national discussion like this. But I will, if you trust me, believe me, that that is ongoing. And we are going to have a national diagnostic center. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we'll have a short 10 minute break and we'll be back to talk about the issue of national cohesion and accountability. Yes, subscribe. You always the watch we program them, but you not subscribe yet to the channel. All wait till you get for do. Press this red subscribe button and then you come over here to and press this bell. To the bell option, press this one with all. And don't don't. And not get for cost you anything. When you do this, na sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. Thank you for all your help me for share this program. Yeah! God bless you. Sacred cows. So I encourage all Sudanians to join me to fight corruption. This is just the beginning. Their promises that led us to a lot of damages. 
Tell the entire web that speech they preach in the and now you need the deceive us. Mm-hmm. The thing we saw it frustrate us. So why can't you laugh? Why can't you steal? Why can't you allow the citizens to be? You see, we just tell you that why we vote tell you. But you screw us. You screw us, okay. you use us and little on abuse us. So why, why, why? Mm. They won't make you lie. Why, why, why? But that's the question that we ask. The people screw us. The people laugh to us. The government betray us. They betray us so much. They lie. The people fool us, so. the people laugh to us, the government betray us, no one to trust, my people no one to hope on, Nobody. my hope that I have have been broken, I'm telling you brother, so where are the schools, where are the roads, where are the jobs that they said they could have for, but they too selfish, the people tired with their rhetoric, people tired, they tired, you see the reason why we ask why the government betray They have enough of time, but yeah, they stay, they delay People suffer, no war, but people crying for hunger Look at, look at, look at Your vision and your mission, your intention, your donation They poor, you got nothing to show Nothing, nothing, mm-hmm. So, why, 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 the government should lie Why, 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 but that's the question that we ask They lie The people lie to us. The government betray us. They preach in D and now you need to deceive us. Mm-hmm. The thing we saw, it frustrates us. So why can't you lie? Why can't you steal? Why can't you allow the citizens to be? You see, we just tell you that why we go tell you. But you fool us, you screw us, you use us and little on abuse us. So why, why, why? The government should lie. Why, why, why? But that's the question that we ask. the mon are you now this we gone to you say and you well and you and just did they give the chance for make you blow your mind now the program called we are for blow your mind the truth you get for say yeah and it no matter what truth you get for say try save the future the truth you get for say yeah and it no matter what truth you get for say Talk now we out Talk about the things gone wrong Talk about the things where they make salon no they go Talk about political violence Talk about regional politics now we out Talk about tribal politics Talk about office politics now we out Talk about teenage pregnancy And early marriage Talk about the sexual violence Talk about corruption now we out Keep on your mind though oh, oh, oh. And for blow your mind The truth you get for say yeah. And it no matter what Truth you get for say Try save the future The truth you get for say yeah. And it no matter what Truth you get for say Talk now we had Talk about we had because now we own no place like home, yeah. Governments of the people, by the people, and for the people, we 
yard, now we get, I'm not afraid for talk. Talk about the things where they go on wrong. For better we had, we only need for talk. We not for set motto. Not saying that you partina for talk the two. We had really better now for me and you. Now for me and you. You just get to blow your mind. The truth you get for say, yeah. And it no matter what truth you get for say. Try save the future, the truth you get for say, yeah. And it no matter what truth you get for say. Talk now, we are. Where they make salon or they grow. Talk about political violence. Talk about regional politics. Now we are. Talk about tribal politics. Talk about office politics. Now we are. Do. Talk about teenage pregnancy and early marriage. Talk about the sexual violence. Talk about corruption. Now we are. No keep on your mind though. Oh, oh. I for blow your mind. The truth you get for say, yeah. And it no matter what truth you get for say. Try save the future, the truth you get for say, yeah. And it no matter what truth you get for say. Talk now we are talk about we are because now we own. No place like home, yeah. Government of the people, by the people. And for the people, we had now we get. I'm not afraid for talk. Talk about the things where they go on wrong. For better, we had. We only need for talk. We not for set motto. Not saying that you partina for talk the two. We had really better now for me and you. Now for me and you. You just get to blow your mind. The truth you get for say. Yeah. And it no matter what. Truth you get for say. Try save the future. The truth you get for say. Yeah. And it no matter what. Truth you get for say. Talk now we are. Talk now we are. 
Talk about the things gone wrong. Talk about the things where they make salon know they grow. Talk about political violence. Talk about regional politics. Now we are. Talk about tribal politics. Talk about office politics. Now we are. Do. Talk about teenage pregnancy. And early marriage. Talk about the sexual violence. Talk about corruption. Now we are. No keep on your mind though. Oh, 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 the truth you get for saying, yeah. And it no matter what truth you get for saying, try save the future. The truth you get for saying, yeah. And it no matter what truth you get for saying. Talk now, we had. Talk about we had because now we own. No place like home, yeah. Government of the people. By the people and for the people, we are now we get. I'm not afraid for talk. Talk about the things where they go on wrong. For better, we are. We only need for talk. We not for set motto. Not saying that you part you not for talk the truth. We are really better now for me and you. Now for me and you. You just get for know you mind the truth you get for say. And it no matter what truth you get for saying, try to save the future. The truth you get for saying, actually keep us together, because all of what we try to divide us, using um, 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 political the, the the ethnic cards to divide people instead of preaching to them what they stand for. So, to a very large extent politics is what has divided us uh, let me go back to a short history which i learned about not too long ago and that is in port loco there is a town there that was manned by mostly mendes from bonth and kailam and they settled there Romani. they came to help baibure to fight and they've been, they settled there and they've been there. Why I'm telling this story is because it tells us that we have been walking across ethnic lines, regions. It is only now that bad politicians have introduced uh, the ethnic card, regional card, and that's why we are divided. It's an imperative. Do you share in that blame yourself? Well, I don't, I don't subscribe to ethnic politics, regional politics. The fact remains that opposition members say they are being shut out of job recruitment. They say that uh, survival has become more, more difficult for them because they feel ostracized by your government. Do you think that's a fair complaint? Opposition? Yes, please. The opposition. <laughs> the opposition. We don't ask for who is in the opposition. Yeah. We ask for qualifications. Well, the way the politics of Sierra Leone is, we, we can agree to disagree on this, but Sierra Leone, our politics is largely along regional lines. So when I say opposition, it's people in the north who feel hard done by your establishment? Um, I have a lot of friends, and I have a lot of people from the north, and a lot, a lot of people voted for me. And even when I go there, that's what I say to them. I, I go to, I've gone to the north more than I've been to the south and the east. And you know why? Because. That is where I had the least vote. But that is because they don't know who I am or what I stand for. And I need to convince them. And I believe they are a part of this country. So I don't discriminate along that line. Um, they are going to cry foul, as you know. Uh, we have to change certain people when we come in. It's done all over the world. Biden did his, and nobody will accuse him of trying.
tribalism, regionalism, and that's the same thing that is done in the UK and elsewhere around the world. But for the most part, we have not pushed out anybody from the civil service. Yeah, but in certain offices, you'd expect that uh, somebody shouldn't lose their job because, you know, of a change in establishment. Like which office? Like in certain parastatals, lots of people lost their jobs when he became president. Not I'm, necessarily I'm, because of a fraudulently or I'm, I'm going to I'm going to, be, I'm going to be judged by my performance and delivery. You are huddled by undermining your establishment or what? Both. <laughs> Both. They do a range of things. You know, with the completely unnecessary. I should somebody lose their job, Mr. President, because they did not support you. I did not talk about support. He said both, Mr. President. Maybe if somebody does not support me, he is likely to be an, a, a hodu. Much more likely to be a hodu. And that's what I'm saying this. We have relatives, APCs, in certain key positions. I don't want to name names. I protect them because they are performing. They know that. All I need from any Israel union, perform. Whether you are red in color, at heart, and if you outwardly, you will stay in your place. So, so, really, I mean, let's face it. You give me leadership, and I'm not going to go to a stranger that I've never worked with, don't know. And then I perform poorly. You're not going to ask, uh, uh, did you, how many people did you take from... Uh, uh, the, the opposition. Besides, Umaru, we were in the opposition. And not you, me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that livelihood was an issue. I don't mean to revenge. All I want from any Israeli union is work hard. The, and that's where unity is actually. When we came in, we drew up the national, uh, the media. The term national development plan. Of course, we sought the, the input. We need to get in the buy-in of a uh, uh, for C, for this to work. So that is where the unity is. But talking about unity, um, we decided to put to have you <laughs> Have you spoken to him since the anti-corruption started investigating him? I don't keep a, a, a tag on that, but I would tell you, he and I speak regularly. But that should be easy to determine whether it was before or after the ACC. I, I, I just don't want to give you a definite answer, but I know I have spoken to him. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly speaking, um, you can verify that with him. <laughs> right, and how is your relationship with him? He's a senior statesman. And I treat him like that. Do you crack jokes when you talk on the phone? <laughs> um, uh, a lot of people told, told the whole world that I had an asset that can destroy this whole nation. And you could not find a razor blade in my home. Except my shaving. What? We don't have a 
lot of jokes to crack about I think there's a mountain of frost between the both of you. I'm not saying that. Those are your words. I talk to him. When I want to talk to him, he calls me when he wants to talk to me. He is a senior state uh, Syrian Union, and he should be treated with respect. He's, uh, he has his entitlements, and those should be given to him. Would you ever countenance the possibility of letting him off the hook? I'm assuming there is a hook on him in terms of the CUI recommendations. Is that something you're countenance and just forget about anything having to do with pursuing the former president? I don't see a hook yet. Possibility. Um, you, as a candidate, spoke a lot about the fight against corruption and uh, the issue of the Commission of Inquiry came back and manifested that. Are you satisfied with the dispensation of justice, uh, particularly in terms of pursuing corrupt officials? Would you say your appointees are sacrosanct in terms of protecting them, or would you say they are just squeaky clean? I'm not, I should not be the determinant person. There is a whole system in place. I have told them exactly what we mean by not having uh, um, uh, sacred cows, not the sacred cows of the past. Now, nobody is protected. The Anti-Corruption Commission is working. I don't talk to them. They don't talk to me where they see corruption they will pursue corruption. And um, of course, we've been talking a lot about um, the audit report. That goes right across the check. And the evils for which they are meant. And would you say the current fight against corruption has minimized corruption in your administration? Or do you think you also have thieves in the administration? I wouldn't call anybody I've appointed as thieves, but I will tell you for sure that now, if you have to steal, you must be very cautious. You know it is risky. You know if you are caught that the penalties can be quite rigid. It's not the impunity. that went along with corruption is what we have taken care of. I think and I believe from the perceptions of this we've had, objective ones, that we have done quite a lot to instill fear. That means we are working. This is not an easy fight. It is not going to be won overnight. Excuse me, <laughs> we have all been corrupt in this country. It, it, we have to make a, a decision to draw a line and change. Sometimes people talk about corruption as if they are Been corrupt. You know, the policeman talks about corruption of the, the, the of the, the politicians. You go to the hospital hospital, they ask you to bring a paper to write on it. That is all corruption. What we have to recognize and acknowledge as a country is that it is not a single single person that has been continue to be honest uh, and I think I should ask you a bit about governance generally would you say you are pleased with the relationship between the central government and the local government I ask this in particular um, because of the apparent frost 
trusting relations between the mayor of Freetown and the Ministry of Local Government. Well, um, in any uh, human organization, there are certain dynamics that go wrong. If you are a subordinate, you have to recognize that you are subordinate. And there, are, there is a supervisory ministry. You must recognize that. If you don't recognize that, that is when friction sets in. But do you think central government should recruit all staff or staff for local councils? That is for the act to decide. What has Not the minister me. advised you on? Say again. What has the minister advised you on that? Does he think recruitment, as was contested by the mayor of Freetown, was correctly done, or did somebody annex some of the person's uh, responsibilities? The, the um, I think that there, there is there is bound to there, there should be consultation, and that I'm talking about because it's an all arrangement. Uh, but the the the, the, um, the acts speaks specifically to that that they have to have an arrangement to be able to elect to to appoint those that um, uh, uh, are eligible and they have to go through uh, I, I, <laughs> the, 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 you, you've spoken about a frosty relationship which I think what I've suggested to the minister is for is for them to have an investigation into this whole matter because it, it, it projects a wrong image of what we really want. Would that be fair? It's like the ministry may be serving as judge and jury at the same time. Um, when you are assuming it's going to be the ministry that is going to... <laughs> yeah, because... And that's that's not my intention. It's to have stakeholders who are going in there to sort out the problem and not, not to compound it. And therefore, you cannot take the ministry or the minister to be in charge of that. But there are as you are doing from other walks of life, you can actually put a group together and say, go delve into this, look at the documentation. Uh, who has the power to do this? And where did they go wrong? And then make recommendations. We ask people to send in the, to, to email us to ask questions. And one of them, Abs Dumbuya, particularly asked about that. So he says that you are most times quiet, probably reticent about happenings, including that's involving the mayor and the Ministry of Local Government and the Auditor General. He feels that you should have spoken a lot more about those issues to have calmed down the situation. As you very well know, I don't talk normally. <laughs> I am not a flippant leader. That's my leadership style. You have to understand it. I comment on national issues as and when it is necessary, extremely necessary. What is going on there, as you very well know, we are a political nation. Even at death, we carry our party colors. So, when issues like this happen, for me, like I said to you much earlier in this conversation, the audit service to Leon, as part of our accountability structures, if we are serious about corruption, we have to listen to them. They have to be, uh, they, have, they have to do a credible job too, so and, that they, they can identify the issues that are wrong, the issues that uh, take place in the various ministries and departments, and that way we can start to address. They, 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 when people talk about not addressing, we have only changed a few people in the system. It's the same old system, the same old people. So you don't expect them to change their, their ways of doing things immediately. The audit service is one of the most respected state institutions in Sierra Leone. And you have said that it's their responsibility to hold your government accountable as much as the law allows them to. 
do you feel sorry for the Auditor General for what she seems to be going through, which some say is harassment, for doing a good job auditing your system? Do you also pity me or my wife when they talk about her? The audit service, you mean? Talk about you and your wife? No. But I'm specific in terms of the audit. You're talking about her now. Yeah. You seem to be concerned about her. But you know what has been said about my person, my wife, and all of these people sitting here? Maybe you are politicians. She is not. Public officer. She is a public. When you step into that space, there is no more fence. You are open. This say everything and anything about you. I am. You think my intervention is going to? Stop? They are telling me I'm a thief. I'm not this, and she cries and that. I say I have been called worse names than that. But no call. Nobody called me to come here. I, I chose to come here. If you can't stand the heat, don't go to the kitchen. That's a good way. I'll just read to you some messages we received by email, Mr. President. Um, Ronald Gidwani says, Mr. President, what has been your biggest or greatest challenge so far during your presidency? So many. The biggest? Um, I have to order these challenges because in Sierra Leone, everything is a challenge and they are all big. Babala. <laughs> I, do, um, I, do, I need a few moments to actually order them and see which ones are going to pop up and sit on top of the huge pie. <laughs> I read it. There's one from Alima to Dimonekene. She writes, Dear Mr. President, I would like to commend you and your administration for your proactive stance in promoting the rights of women and girls in Sierra Leone. More recently, in celebrating International Women's Day, you personally recognized the role of women and young girls, such as gender based violence, that keep women. girls behind. Your Excellency, sir, I and many other women and girls who are victims and survivors of abuse today are asking you to grant us the ultimate gift. Here, is it. Here it is. We ask that you once and for all, remove tears and of our country and of course successive governments have not been able to bring it to rest. But there is a law. There is the um, the children is a law. What we need to do
which is difficult. For even the woman who, and she has just put a whole list of things there. Which after 18, you make a decision. That is a good beginning. If you go like that for the next 10, 20 years, this is a practice I believe we die out for itself. Let me put this to you. There's another letter here from Ahmed Sahid. Nazrella from the live audience, who writes, Mr. President, I heard you on Radio Democracy speaking strongly on the Cyber Crime Bill 2020. assurances can you give that if passed into law, it will not automatically re the huge gains your government has made. a new space. So it should be clear to everybody that we are doing this because now they think they knows how to handle the uh, um, um, Things in the cyberspace can cause war in this country. What's happening is everybody is, a, is an investor in this country. People come with less than 5,000 and we hold their uh, portfolio, we go behind after them. Oh. I get to investor. We want to just <laughs> what everybody they have to. Immediately certify that, give you all your paper. In a very short time. That is basically it. Right. An anonymous one here. 
no regrets, so you've made no mistakes, you think? Um, mistakes. Could you have appointed a lot more women, for example, in government? Yeah. I will appoint women. I have women. More women. More women. Seems grossly inadequate compared to the population of women in the country. Yes, but like I told you before, uh, maybe we are using different criteria. <laughs> and when I know more women who, who can deliver and believe in what I am doing or want to do, be sure they are going to come on board. I don't discriminate against. But let me tell you a story. I lost my dad when I was only four. And I've never had a, a, a male in my life. You've never had a male? How do you mean? At home. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I believe in women. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are among the best. When it comes to resilience, they can be more loyal than us. They are great fighters. And they deal with stress more comfortably than you and I. I see, you women here. <laughs> I, I see you are going bald already and you're a very young man. <laughs> Don't mind me. <laughs> And I have a lot of gray hair too. Okay. That is because of the stress. We are in together. We put up with a lot of that. Right. Honorable Sir Emerson Lamina, leader of the C4C in Parliament, who is in the audience. Right. Your Excellency, what is your view on the winner takes all and ethnicity as factors that undermine democratic consolidation and political inclusion in the body politic of Sierra Leone for the last 20 years? Well, I'm. I am proposing proportional representation. Again, you, we are talking about peace election. and peaceful coexistence in this country. We have realized, I have realized as a leader, that we need to be together, irrespective of our political uh, uh, colors. How do we do this? We know you, Umaru. I don't want you to hide behind any colors when you want to contest for political leadership. I, I hear in the next few years. You hear? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not true, Mr. President. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, you want to stand there as Umaru, who is known, has a track record of talk and do, who is credible, who says things and do them. So we vote not for color, but Umaru, who is going to deliver? Because we know him. We hide behind colors. And because these colors have structures, these structures come into motion immediately. If you touch me, you touch a lot of other people, and they are going to fight. And because this enmity has been there from independence, that's why there is a lot of violence. We have to dismantle all of this. And sometimes, let's say in the north, if, if there are being proportional representation, I will have some, 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 some people from the north. So let's get into that, Mr. President. Are you saying you are calling for PR system against the 2023 elections? If, if so, does that presuppose that we are going to have a review of our constitution voted on before the elections? Hmm. That is a tall order, as you know. Already, there is opposition to it from a lot of quarters. But I have to sit down with them and convince them I'm not doing this for 2023. You mean within your party opposition to rates? Because no. my understanding is the APC don't seem to be opposed to the proportional representation system. That's my understanding. We don't have the same understanding. <laughs> really? Yes. If you can help me push this forward. For me, I want to live a more peaceful country when I leave this office. And I want us to treat one another for who we are. Nobody should hide behind colors. Um, so you know that from the time you, you start to go to school, if you want to join politics, you start to do the right things. 
So when you stand up uh, uh, come forward for any position, people have a way of evaluating who you are, and they will vote or not vote for you based on how much they know you. Thank you, sir. Nyamakoro Saratasila, who is also in the audience here, says, Sierra Leone remains one of the poorest countries in the world, ranking 180 out of 187 countries. What specifically has their government done to alleviate this? Well, as I've said, we should, not be, we should not expect magic to happen overnight. This was regarded as one of the most corrupt countries, and therefore, we deserve that position. What have I done? Now I've removed Sierra Leone on the corruption index, especially with the MCC, which is an outsider group that made an assessment of our fight. Now we have moved from 49 and we are in the 80s. That is one effort. In the way we handle national issues, when we had Ebola, it was not only a health catastrophe, but a serious scandal around monies that we have spent. Today, the way we have handled COVID, we are rated among the best in the world even ahead of the United States. Yes. We are inching toward what uh, the lady is, it, it, is, it is aspirational. Why do I insist on human capital development? A major move. It is because whatever we say or do, until we have quality education, we can bring our kids uh, um, at par, make them competitive in the world, useful, for, uh, with, 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 uh, um, I mean, as useful citizens in the 21st century, we are never going to move an inch forward. So, very slow, it may be very slow, but that human capital development, which once made us the Athens of West Africa, have gone back to it. We are the most important asset in this country. You can count your diamonds, gold, and that, and one day they are all going to be finished. We are going to be here, and we do development, and we are the target of development. Until and unless we invest in us, human beings, we can never move. So all of these we baby steps are we are taking to is towards that aspiration. So, to, make, to remove us slow. from that it stigma, that shameful position that human in the world. Development. They are Most very important steps. Asset the in countries this country. that you can count your diamonds, gold, and that, and one day they are all going to be finished. We are going to be here, and we do development, and we are the target of development. We invest in us, human beings. We can never move. So. All of these baby steps we are taking is towards that aspiration to make to from that stigma, that shameful position in the world. They are baby steps. The leaders today have had to take theirs, and they've been taking them for over centuries. That is why you have the United States, you have the Singapore's of the world, you have the United Kingdom, and. Australia and all Germany, France and all of these, they have had to deliberately, intentionally say we are going to search forward. And you take step after step and it requires the commitment from all of us. And that is what I will say that I invite the whole of Sierra Leone. When we say free quality education, it is not my program. It is free quality uh, education for Sierra Leone because it lays the strongest foundation Personal development, personal development, and to be a useful, a meaningful part, productive part of the 21st century. I know I've spilled over, but I think it's a spill that is worthy of it. Sorry, Sengbe Mara, govern, governance advocate and lawyer, who is also in the audience. If one were to ask you, what are the highlights of your judicial reforms? What would you point to apart from new judges? We have not taken much step as far as the judiciary is concerned, I must confess. Why is that? 
not because it doesn't matter. In fact, as a matter of fact, it is one of the areas that we need to really look at. What I have tasked them is for them to actually come together and tell us what is it that we need to do, not only in terms of conditions of service, but what we can do to make them more effective. Because as you all know, without the rule of law, there can be no peace that, that we are talking about. And uh, that was exemplified in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But that is a, a, a fact. So it is not because it is not important. It is because, as I, I, as I said earlier, there are too many things to do and you have to order. Which one comes first, second, third, and so on and so forth. But now that you've reminded me, definitely, I think that is a good point to take. But are you pleased with the justice, with the dispensation of justice? And so, do you think citizens get justice, or do you think it's uh, uh, they don't? Well, I never got justice when I was in opposition, and uh, it has not changed much. It doesn't make it right, does it? <laughs> no. So I cannot say there is. Uh, um, 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 people are happy with the justice system and that's why I concur with you that we need to embark on certain reforms within the justice system. When will we see that move? To I cannot give you a, 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 a trust me definitely. It is a legitimate concern and needs to be addressed. Would you rather we had a system whereby the chief justice cannot be changed just because there's a change in the government? Yes, if the Chief Justice is not a politician who will go campaigning, who has vied for leadership in the opposition. Yes. If the Chief Justice decides to be a professional, strictly professional, ethical, dispenses justice or is interested in making sure that the structure he presides over dispenses justice. I will keep him there, keep him or her there as long as time can permit. Thank you, Mr. President. Unfortunately, we don't have time. We've already eaten into the agreed time, so I will just um, thank you on behalf of the organizers of this show, Mr. President, for your time here for this uh, special edition of the CRI debates, which uh, was organized by CRI and uh, funded by, or sponsored rather, by Mercury International, Il Raj, Officel, and produced by AYB. Thank you very much, Mr. President. For your time. Thank you for coming. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. We'll have a 30-minute cocktail outside. The president has agreed to it.